Hi, my name's Ellen, and today I'm going to be presenting some of my ongoing research on the language of school EFL textbooks. This is part of my PhD work, which I'm completing at the University of Osnabrück. And if you've never heard of Osnabrück, you're forgiven. It's about 400 kilometers north of Heidelberg, where this digital conference is hosted. And I'm currently speaking to you from my home in Cologne, which by train would be about mid-journey. In many secondary schools across the world, and certainly in Europe, foreign language syllabi are often very much based on commercial textbooks. And that means that the textbooks are both the content and the medium of instruction in the English classroom. Many teachers and indeed students will often say that they find the language of textbooks to be somehow uh, inauthentic or almost a special kind of school English, which doesn't seem to match the reality that they find in the uh, real world outside the classroom. So let's have a look at what a modern textbook looks like. Here's an example from the popular textbook series Green Line by the German publisher Klett. Let's have a look at the first unit. We find lots of instructions, lots of explanations, but also some words and sentences without context in the form of exercises, for instance. We also see longer text, like this dialogue here, an extract of a conversation. On other pages, we find some longer informative texts or some narrative text extracts of novels, for instance. There are also things like songs, poetry and rhyme. So we saw that modern textbooks feature a range of different registers. And since we know that language varies greatly across different registers, I'm interested in finding out the extent of this register variation within textbooks. In other words, I'd like to know whether we're dealing with one type of textbook English or whether textbooks differentiate between the various registers that they attempt to portray. My second research question looks at how textbook English registers differ uh, from comparable target learner language registers. And then as a final step, I attempt to identify the specific linguistic features which characterize textbook English registers. Now there have been many attempts to explore the language of English as a foreign language textbooks, and many of these are corpus-based too. However, they often either evaluate textbook language by considering it as one register, or they focus on one register within the textbooks. I'm thinking here, for example, of the corpus-driven research on the representation of spoken interactions in uh, school textbooks by Dieter Mint and Ute Römer. And what all of these studies have in common is that they explore just one or a handful of linguistic phenomena each. So we have a vast patchwork of textbook English studies, but currently no overall picture of what textbook English looks like and how it might differ from naturally occurring English. So that's why I've decided to explore the registers of textbook English using multi multidimensional analysis, MDA. MDA is a method uh, that was developed by Douglas Biber, and of course, many of you will be familiar with his 1988 publication, Variation Across Speech and Writing, in which he first described how MDA can be applied to the study of language variation across a number of registers. The process is quite complex, and I don't have time to go into the detail. Many of you will be familiar with the method already. Essentially, uh, first, it's necessary to compile a large corpus that represents the full register variety that's to be explored in the study. And then a broad range of linguistic features are chosen, and these are usually automatically tagged and counted for in all of the texts of the corpus. Subsequently, a correlation matrix um, can be computed for all of the features that have been tagged. And in Biber's 1988 analysis, this resulted in the correlation matrix of 67 features. And then factor analysis is conducted with the aim of extracting the maximum amount of shared variance. So that means that when several linguistic features are highly correlated, that means they co-occur frequently within a text, a factor can be defined. And then these extracted factors can be functionally interpreted. Now, there are really two ways to use MDAs in new studies. 
On the one hand, it's possible to conduct what's been referred to as an additive MDA, which means that we can apply a model um, derived from a previous MDA to a new corpus of a new register, for instance. And most additive MDAs so far have used Bibler's original study from 1988 as a reference model. So to do so, it's necessary to count exactly the same linguistic features as Biber did. Alternatively, it's possible to uh, compute a full new MDA. This requires a large corpus that represents, as I said, the full variety of registers to be explored. And in this presentation, I'll show the results of both an additive MDA and a full MDA of textbook English registers. I'll start with the additive MDA, uh, which used Biber's 1988 model as a baseline for exploring the registers of my um, textbook English corpus. But first, let's have a look at the corpus itself. It consists of nine series of EFL textbooks from eight different publishers, and uh, these are textbooks used at lower secondary school level in Spain, France, and Germany. Each series has four to five textbooks, which means that the textbook English corpus uh, consists of 43 textbook volumes, as well as the scripts and transcripts of the accompanying audio and video materials. All of the texts were um, extracted from the textbooks, and then these were manually annotated for the six uh, major registers um, which I identified in these textbooks. So that's conversation, informative text, personal communication, things like letters and diary entries, instructional language, poetry, song and rhyme, and fiction. Now, for the additive MDA, it would have been possible to simply compare the dimension scores of these um, textbook texts um, to the registers that were included in Biber's original model. Um, for conversation, that's the London Lun corpus, and it's the Brown corpus for most of the written material. However, I think that's problematic for a number of reasons. Uh, first, uh, the corpora used in Biber's original analysis no longer represent contemporary English. And that's what we would expect to find in school textbooks. A second, all of the written texts in Biber's original corpora were targeted at an adult readership. And that's not the case, obviously, for um, these school textbooks. And thirdly, from a methodological point of view, I did not have access to, Biber, to the Biber tagger. Uh, which um, he used in his analysis, um, but rather I use Adrianini's MAT tagger, which aims to emulate the Biber tagger and overall does a great job, but it still, I think, makes sense um, to use reference corpora that are processed with exactly the same tools. So in seeking a suitable reference corpus, I decided to focus on what um, the target learner language should be. In other words, uh, what are students expected to be able to do after five, six years of secondary school English tuition? And if we look at the curricula, it's quite clear that the primary expectation is for students to be able to communicate and uh, mostly in spoken conversation. Um, secondly, they're expected to be able to read in English, ideally be equipped to read for pleasure outside of the classroom. And a third strong focus nowadays is on being able to obtain and transfer information in English. So my reference um, corpus, uh, or rather my reference corpora, um, consists of three parts. First, I've used the uh, new spoken BNC um, 2014 as the reference corpus for conversation. Um, for um, youth fiction, I've compiled my own corpus, which includes samples from 300 novels aimed at teenagers and young adults. And then I've put together a corpus of informative websites targeted at teenagers, which includes uh, revision pages, news, online encyclopedia, and, and so on and so forth. So these um, three corpora are going to form the basis of my reference data to compare the textbook registers to. Putting this together means that it's possible to compare, say, the dialogues from the textbooks 
with the spoken BNC 2014. Or it's possible to focus on the narrative text and the textbooks and compare those to the youth fiction corpus. So let's have a look at some of the key results from the additive MDA, which, as I said, used Biber's 1988 model of um, general English as a baseline. On Biber's first dimension, you see here uh, the scores for the six registers of my textbook corpus. And as we would expect, we find that textbook conversation scores highest compared to these other uh, textbook registers. Instructional and informative language, again, as we may have expected, score lowest on this first scale. When we compare textbook conversation to Biber's registers, we find that textbook conversation is much lower down the scale than we would expect. In fact, uh, Biber's face-to-face -face conversations uh, scored around 35 on average on this first dimension. But what are the features that contribute to this lower score? However, you may remember that I also decided to tag an extract count for the spoken BNC. And when I looked at the average Dimension 1 score for the spoken BNC 2014, um, I actually found that the scores were uh, quite a bit lower than Biber's face-to-face -face conversation corpus. Nevertheless, we see that uh, the spoken BNC scores are still uh, considerably higher than the textbook conversation scores. Um, the problem with using the spoken BNC 2014 as a reference corpus and using uh, Biber's uh, 1988 model as the baseline is that um, five variables that load positively on this first dimension require the use of punctuation marks in their operationalization. Now, this is problematic because, as you may be aware, the spoken BNC 2014 does not include any punctuation marks except question marks. So what I ended up doing is recalculating the Dimension 1 scores without the five variables that rely on punctuation marks. And what you can see here is that the scores from the spoken BNC 2014 are considerably higher than those from textbook conversation. So we have an even greater gap that becomes very obvious. But what we can also see from this rain plot diagram is that the scores of um, the textbook conversations are quite dispersed. And so I was interested to find out whether there might be some kind of systematic patterning among this dispersion. I first tried to see if there might be an effect related to the levels of the various textbooks. Here at the bottom, with the letter A, you have the beginner textbooks, and here at the top, level E represents the more advanced textbooks in the corpus. Well, actually, we don't find an effect for levels, so that means that textbook conversations score lower on dimension one across all of the levels. We do see an effect for series, however. English in Mind, a textbook series published by Cambridge University Press, as well as the latest edition of the Green Line series by Klett, seem to score higher uh, than the other textbooks. And at the other end of the scale, we have the French collaborative series Piece of Cake, which consistently scores below average as compared to the other conversations from the other textbooks. But still, it's a very small effect that we can observe here. But what are the features that contribute to these uh, very low Dimension 1 scores for textbook conversation? Where pretty much all of the features that load positively on Biber's first dimension are less frequent in textbook conversation than they are in the spoken BNC 2014. And at the other end of the scale, the features that load negatively on this first dimension are far more frequent in textbook conversation. So what does that look like in practice? Well, a naturally occurring conversation like the ones we find in the BNC will include a lot of uh, personal pronouns, especially first and second pronouns, and then uh, the pronoun it. We find lots of private verbs like to think and to know, that deletion, negation, the use of uh, the word because, for instance. Textbook conversation, as I said, is much more nominal in style 
So we have lots of nouns, some of them are qualified with adjectives. We also have more prepositions. Now you'll note that we have a lot of proper nouns in here, and that's something that will be uh, rectified in the full MDA, because currently in this additive MDA, the proper nouns that occur at the start of such dialogues that are printed in the textbooks are counted as nouns for uh, the dimension one scores, and that's potentially problematic. I'll skip over this second dimension for reasons of time and just say a few brief words about the third dimension. What we find here is that uh, two textbook registers score high on this dimension. That's um, informative and instructional. Informative texts are expected to score relatively high on this dimension and indeed uh, the informative text from the reference data scores similarly high scores on this third dimension. We might ask ourselves, why is it that instructional language scores so high on this third dimension? And this is actually really due in particular to the prominence of one linguistic feature that loads positively on this third dimension. And that's what Biber refers to as phrasal coordination. That's two adjectives, adverbs, verbs or nouns coordinated by end. And it's a pattern which occurs more frequently across all textbook registers than on average in Biber's general English corpus, but it's particularly frequent in textbooks instructional and informative texts. So think of phrases such as ask and answer, listen and check, read and listen, listen and repeat, and also adjectives combinations like German and English or true and false. These are very common in the instructional texts of the textbooks. So I'd now like to show you some preliminary results from the full MDA. The first step is obviously to select the features that are going to be counted in the text. I chose to retain many of Biber's original features. I added the semantic verb categories from Biber 2006. And then I added a number of additional um, new features, which I thought would be perhaps relevant to textbook language. I also made sure that the noun counts no longer counted proper nouns, and I changed the op operationalization of the features that required punctuation marks. So I ended up with 84 features, which I counted in 5,805 texts. Then some of the features had to be eliminated because they were not frequent enough or didn't enter in any significant correlation with other features. I therefore ended up with 72 features, and here's the correlation matrix of those. The, um, as we can see, perhaps here in slightly bigger, we have um, some uh, negative correlations like this one in red. Um, this is first person pronouns and average word length. So that makes sense. If we have lots of I and me on average in that text, the words are going to be fairly short. And here is an example of a positive correlation in blue. We have pragmatic markers, which is a category, a feature I added, as well as because, um, two features that correlate positively and that are going to be more frequent, as we can imagine, in conversation. The KMO score um, for this correlation matrix is 91%. Um, this is a measure of how suited the data is for factor analysis, so it indicates the proportion of variance in the variables that might be caused by underlying factors. And according to Kaiser himself, 91% is marvellous, so we're all set for the factor analysis. Um, but before I show you those results, um, here's an appetizer, so to speak, in the form of a principal component analysis. And I think this is interesting because what we can see here are um, three components on one plot. Um, these components together explain 41% of the variance in the data. And we see uh, very clear clusters for the reference data. We have in green uh, the youth fiction, in uh, purple the informative text from websites, and in uh, yellow at the back there the spoken BNC 2014. The textbook registers, on the other hand, are clustered in the middle, and there's only one um, textbook register that stands out, and that's here in orange, the instructional language. 
we can see that the informative text in the textbooks, here in dark blue, do overlap quite a bit with the informative text from the reference data. Similarly, um, the fiction from the textbooks in light green also overlap with the green from the youth fiction reference data. However, um, there is hardly any overlap at all um, between here in red the textbook conversation and in yellow uh, the spoken B and C. So we can see that these two clusters hardly overlap at all. So let's have a look at the results of the full MDA. I chose to extract four factors that together account for 41% of the total variance. In the first dimension, uh, which explains the most variance, is very similar to Biber's first dimension, so for now I've also called it involved versus informational production, and many of the features are the same as on Biber's first dimension. If we look at what the textbook registers look like on this dimension, we find that personal communication, which you'll remember are letters and diary entries, as well as the textbook conversation, score highest. But we find that the spoken BNC scores are considerably higher than those of the textbook conversation. And if we look at what that, why that is, again, we find that the BNC is much more involved. Uh, many of the features are far more typical of online elaboration. As opposed to textbook conversation, which is still very nominal, uh, which includes a lot of determiners, adjectives, prepositions, and high type token ratios. The second dimension is one that for now I've called complex edited versus direct personal exchange. What we find here is that the informational text score higher. We have uh, the informative here in blue from the textbooks, and here's the informative text in the reference data and they score higher on this particular dimension. The third dimension is very similar to Biber's narrative dimension, with past tense and third-person pronouns scoring positively on this dimension. We find that actually textbooks that feature uh, fiction tend to have uh, texts which are very similar to those in the youth fiction reference corpus. So when we look at the uh, dimension scores here, we find that fiction in the textbooks is over here and the youth fiction is over here. So very similar scores. It would appear that uh, the fiction texts that are featured in the textbooks are um, very much like those from the youth fiction reference corpus. And finally, onto the fourth dimension. And this is really the factor that we already saw in the principal component analysis plot. You remember the orange cluster, which were the instructional text from the textbooks as a very distinct type of English. And this is what we're also seeing here. So all of the features here are very typical of instructional language with lots of imperatives, the use of the second person pronoun, and things like mental verbs, which include the verb to read or to choose. So when we look at the registers plotted on this fourth dimension, then we really see that there's just one that sticks out like a sore thumb, and that's the instructional language at the very top here. So that was a very brief overview of some of my explorations of the registers of school EFL textbooks. I showed you some of the key results of the additive MDA and then presented a full MDA as well as the results of a principal component analysis using the same linguistic features as for, as for the full MDA. Now the conclusions are only preliminary, as I said this is ongoing work. What we can see is that whilst there is some register variation in the textbooks, it's of a condensed form so far less than what we find in the target learner language reference corpora. There's only one textbook register that seems to be very distinct, and that's instructional language. You'll remember the orange cluster from the PCA plot. And actually, instructions and explanations make up almost a third of the word count of textbook text, so it's a considerable amount of the language input that students receive via the textbook and it's a very special kind of English as we've seen. On the whole, we found that uh, conversation is very poorly represented in textbooks. But on a more positive note, 
we found that fiction is far more accurately represented. And indeed, many of the fiction texts featured in the textbooks are extracts of novels and books targeted at teenagers and young adults. So if it's possible to include authentic material for the fiction text in the textbooks, then can we not have more corpus-informed conversation in the textbooks? That's it for me today. Thank you very much for tuning in. If you have any questions, comments or suggestions, they're very welcome on Slack, via email or on Twitter. I look forward to hearing from you.